In recent years, socialist ideals have been on the rise in many Latin American countries. The failure of free market reforms to improve the condition of the poor and promote growth in the economy has caused many Latin Americans to elect leaders who promote socialist programs in order to bring about social and political reforms that would benefit the poor and working class citizens. Since the election of Hugo Chavez in Venezuela in 1998, six more socialist presidents have risen to power through democratic means in South America. This trend is a stark contrast to the decades of right-leaning regimes that dominated the continent's political makeup for decades. Chile and Bolivia provide perfect case studies for socialist reforms carried out through democratic means. Socialist leadership in the two nations came at distinct periods in history and occurred in nations with varying demographics, size, and economic and political histories. Even so, Similarities can be seen between the two instances of socialist governance, and these issues help clarify the roots of socialist movements in Latin America. This leads one to question of what factors contributed to the election of socialist governments in Chile in 1970 and Bolivia in 2005. Socialism is defined as a political and economic theory of social organization which advocates that the means of production, distribution, and exchange should be owned or regulated by the society as a whole. Socialism is a middle way between capitalism and communism, proposing that revolutionary social changes leading to equality and social justice can be achieved by peaceful constitutional means. Chilean socialist president Salvador Allende did not believe that to be a communist or a socialist was to be a totalitarian. He stated, I think socialism frees man. When asked how he would define socialism, Bolivia's socialist president Evo Morales stated, to live in community and equality. Fundamentally, in the peasant communities, they have socialism. It is an economic model based on solidarity, reciprocity, community, and consensus. Because for us, democracy is a consensus. Chile, a nation rich in natural resources, has struggled since its independence in 1818 to create a working economic and political system. Throughout the beginning of the 20th century, Chile was a country dominated by the oligarchic elite who monopolized both the industrial and agricultural sectors. Beginning in the 1920s, Chile's leaders received loans from the United States and the International Monetary Fund under the condition that they would implement neoliberal policies. The United States placed the economic and political pressures on Chile to allow private companies to gain control of industries, in particular, copper. In exchange for economic support, the IMF imposed the implementation of structural adjustment programs. These adjustments included trade liberalization, currency devaluation, the removal of state subsidies, the privatization of state-owned enterprises, and the granting of favorable conditions to foreign investors. Government adherence to these policies, especially under the leadership of the presidents Alessandri and Frey in the 1950s and 1960s, caused cuts in social programs throughout the following decades, which led to further impoverishment of working-class Chileans. In the years leading up to the 1970 election of Salvador Allende, 40% of Chileans suffered from malnutrition, 3% of the population received over 40% of the nation's income, and 50% of the working population earned only slightly more than 10% of the wealth. Agricultural workers suffered under large landholders who denied them basic rights and who reaped the benefit of the profits. Social discontent was widespread throughout much of Chile's agricultural sector. Chilean copper miners were also dealing with unfair working conditions and poverty. They saw the effects of privatization measures firsthand as they dealt with the private corporations, such as Anaconda and Kennecott, who exploited Chilean workers in unsafe conditions for little pay and with no social benefits. Rampant poverty and general discontent of the working poor of Chile led to support for the FRAP, or Front of Popular Action Party an increase in unionization and the beginning of social movements attempting to address injustices. One element that contributed to social mobilization was the Nueva Cancion, or New Song Movement, inspired by the struggles of the peasants and workers during the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. It combined the traditional folk music of Latin America with a strong message of cultural, social, and political reform.
Its popularity helps spread awareness of the injustices perpetrated against the poor into the collective consciousness of the country. The Nueva Cancion movement coincided with the growing trade union movement that had been slowly increasing in size and was beginning to connect with the university students. The supporters of the socialist candidate Salvador Allende wrote the lyrics of Nueva Cancion songs on the walls of buildings across the country. In the presidential election of 1970, Salvador Allende represented La Unidad Popular, or Popular Unity Party, which succeeded the FRAP as the prominent left-leaning political organization. The party was a coalition of socialists, union leaders, communists, radicals, and social democrats, all looking for an end to neoliberal policies. The Popular Unity Party pledged to nationalize industry and natural resources, abolish the literacy test for suffrage, guarantee the rights of workers to organize and strike, initiate administrative decentralization, draft a new constitution which would provide a unicameral legislature, democratize the armed forces, change divorce laws, and embark on an independent foreign policy with diplomatic recognition of all governments. After a runoff election, Allende was chosen by the people and was formally elected by Congress on October 24, 1970. Allende began his presidency by implementing what he called the Chilean path to socialism. His first step was making good on his promise to nationalize the copper industry. In Allende's words, nationalization of the copper industry is key to controlling our economic destiny and winning our second independence. Referring to the previous reliance on U.S. and other foreign loans, Allende stated, For our own culture to flourish, it is necessary to liberate ourselves from that which is foreign and comes prepackaged and prefabricated. We must develop our own technological capacity and shake ourselves from this dependency. Other reforms included the creation of a free milk program for children in schools and poor neighborhoods, the continuation and expansion of phrase land redistribution policies, government administration of health care and education systems, and a raise in Chile's working class salaries from 53% to 59.6%. Unemployment was cut in half during Allende's first year in office. Although Allende's social and economic policies were widely successful in the first year he was in office, there were many forces opposing the progress he had set in motion. Although Chile was implementing a socialist economic system with a socialist president at its head, the USSR was not willing to sponsor Allende as they had Castro in Cuba. Allende's use of democratic measures and lack of military enforcement to change government policy, which had earned him legitimacy in the eyes of the world, caused the Soviet Union to see him as a weak link that would soon be broken by the United States. Despite lack of security threat, the success of Allende's socialist measures through entirely legitimate means worried U.S. anti-communist leaders in a Cold War setting. They were concerned that other nations in Latin America and throughout the world would attempt to implement the same reforms if the experiment in Chile proved triumphant and that this would lead to communism in Latin America. In addition, Allende's nationalization of industries and natural resources meant that the U.S. government and private companies were no longer benefiting economically from Chile. September 11th, 1973. A violent military coup d'etat facilitated by the CIA and led by General Pinochet of the Chilean army overthrew President Allende. Pinochet's forces bombed La Moneda, the government palace, and with a farewell address to the country, Chile's Salvador Allende was soon found dead. The CIA's covert operations to undermine Allende had set in motion on September 15, 1972, when Nixon ordered CIA Director Richard Helms to instigate a military coup in Chile that would prevent Allende from taking power or unseat him if he took office. In the meantime, Director Helms was instructed to make the Chilean economy scream. After taking power, Pinochet banned all political parties and reinstated former free market and neoliberal reforms. Immediate arrests were made of leftist leaders and those seemingly sympathetic to their cause. Thousands were taken to Santiago Stadium where they were tortured, killed, and thrown into mass graves. 
A 2011 commission identified the total number of victims during the, Pin the Pinochet's regime to be 40,018, including 3,065 killed. Pinochet would remain in power until international pressure brought about a referendum in 1988. In 1989, Patricio Alwin became president in the first democratic election since the start of Pinochet's regime. By the time of his death on December 10, 2006, about 300 criminal charges were still pending against Pinochet in Chile for numerous human rights violations, tax evasion, and embezzlement during his 17-year rule and afterwards. Although Allende had not been successful in finalizing the implementation of his socialist reforms due to the enormity of the forces against him, he proved that with adequate support and organization, a socialist leader could have a positive impact on a nation. Allende worked towards the dream of revolutionary changes within a democratic and constitutional framework. This experiment in social and economic change provided a model for development in Latin America during the decades to come. Bolivia, a nation with 80% of its citizens claiming some degree of indigenous heritage, was ruled by an elite class of European descent for five centuries. From the time of Spanish colonization and continuing long after independence from Spain, Bolivia's indigenous population suffered injustices and oppression. Spanish conquistadores divided arable land into encomiendas, or large estates, and used indigenous workers as slaves to produce crops. After independence, criollos, or Bolivians of Spanish descent, controlled the states. The Law of Separation in 1868, which allowed for the takeover of traditional indigenous homelands and the expulsion of families from their homes, forced already poor farmers into regions of Bolivia less suited for growing crops and further ostracized from society an already marginalized people. The Aymara and Quechua indigenous groups who traditionally participated in communal farming saw the loss of 40% of communally held rural lands. Beginning with the Spanish use of forced labor during the 16th century, Bolivia's indigenous population was exploited in the extraction of the country's vast mineral resources, principally silver and tin. As with agricultural workers, miners were denied basic rights and frequently died from harsh treatment. They were forced to work up to 20 hours a day in dangerous conditions and in both sweltering and freezing temperatures. Their meager wages were insufficient to buy provisions from company stores and they often became indebted to their employers for life. By the beginning of the 20th century, miners began to form unions in order to fight for higher wages and shorter workdays. By the Nationalist Revolution in 1952, Miners' unions were demanding the nationalization of mines, the redistribution of land to poor farmers, and suffrage for indigenous populations. In 1965, a new land called the Mining Code privatized the state mining company. This resulted in massive firings, especially of union leaders, and in the lowering of miners' salaries by 25%. Legal and physical force were used to confront any protesters. The Central Obrera Boliviana, or Bolivian Workers Central, was created as a response to this brutality. It embodied the aspirations of Bolivia's poor and working class and cohesively fused demands for labor rights with the struggle for civil and social rights. Government suppression of the Bolivia Workers Central and general union movements continued through the 1960s. For the next few decades, neoliberal policies, like those seen in Chile, were imposed on Bolivia through the IMF structural adjustment programs. Unstable governance in Bolivia, as it experienced a succession of military takeovers, discouraged economic progress, and caused the country to become even more reliant on foreign aid. At the same time, Bolivian citizens suffered from the results of political and economic instability as poverty levels skyrocketed. After his election in 1985, Victor Paz Estensoro reduced social spending, privatized state-owned enterprises, and opened the country to direct foreign investment. These new policies resulted in 20,000 miners losing their jobs, 
which led to a number of strikes and riots, and the eventual government declaration of a state of siege. Throughout the late 1980s and 1990s, opposition movements, spearheaded by coca-growing campesinos in Cochabamba, and joined by displaced miners, resisted United States and IMF policies, and created a resurgence of indigenous identity. In 1994, law of popular participation allowed for more indigenous organization and influence, as decentralization allowed for indigenous participation in regional politics. Through this organization, the Movimiento al Socialismo, MAS, was first created as a social movement and later became a political party that won four seats in the lower house of Congress in 1997. The MAS identified itself as an indigenous-based political party calling for the nationalization of industry and fair distribution of natural resources. A song movement similar to Nueva Canción in Chile helped the MAS gain grassroots support from working citizens throughout Bolivia. The music combined traditional Andean instrumentation and melodies with lyrics that had political and social messages. Although it was not nearly as influential as the song movement in Chile had been, it did contribute to the awareness of and support for the MAS. In Cochabamba, in the year 2000, the private company Agua Tunari was given exclusive rights to privatize the city's water system. Water rates were raised 35% and many were unable to pay for the service. A rebellion against the privatization of the water system inspired members of neighborhood organizations, unions, students, and indigenous farmers to unite against the policies of the government and of private companies. After months of strikes and protests, the Agua Centunari executives fled the country, and the water system was placed in the control of a federation of peasant farmers factory workers, engineers, and environmentalists. In 2003, the Bolivian gas conflict broke out. Strikes and roadblocks mounted by indigenous and labor groups brought the country to a standstill. Violent suppression by the Bolivian armed forces left some 60 people dead on October 2003, mostly inhabitants of the region El Alto, located on the Altiplano above the capital city, La Paz. On October 17, 2003, Evo Morales' support from Cochabamba tried to march into Santa Cruz de la Sierra, the largest city of the eastern lowlands, where support was strong for the president. They returned back. Faced with the option of resigning or more bloodshed, President Sanchez de Lozada offered his resignation in a letter to an emergency session of Congress. After his resignation was accepted and his vice president, Carlos Mesa, invested, he left on a commercially scheduled flight for the United States. Evo Morales, a former union leader who represented coca growers, won the presidential election of 2005 with an absolute majority of 54% of the vote and became Bolivia's first indigenous president. As leader of the MAS, he ran on a platform of reducing poverty among the country's indigenous population, erasing restrictions on coca farmers, renationalizing the country's energy sector, fighting corruption, and increasing taxes on the wealthy. Morales also promised to rewrite the Bolivian constitution in a way that would increase the rights of the country's indigenous population. During his first term, President Morales followed through on his campaign promises. Despite constant obstruction by the opposing parties, he nationalized Bolivia's gas fields and oil industry and signed into law a land reform bill that called for the redistribution of unproductive land to the poor. Welfare, nutrition, health care, and education programs were put in place. The new constitution was approved by voters in 2009. Evidence that President Morales' policies had a measurable impact on Bolivian society could be seen in the change in percentage of the population living in poverty before and after he took office. In 2002, 65% of the population was living in poverty, and 40% was living in extreme poverty. In 2010, those numbers had decreased to 46% living in poverty and 25% living in extreme poverty. In December 2009, Evo Morales was re-elected president with 64% of the vote 
a 10% increase in support from his victory in 2005. He easily defeated his conservative opponent and even gained ground in the opposition stronghold of Santa Cruz. He has promised to increase the role of the state in the economy and accelerate the pace of change. In 2010, he nationalized energy generating firms and reformed pensions, taking over private funds and extending the state pension to millions of poor Bolivians. The movement for socialism in Bolivia, as in Chile, has its roots in a disillusionment with the neoliberal policies that had the effect of denying citizens control of their land and natural resources, and the right to make economic, social, and political decisions. In addition, Bolivia's socialist movement has a strong association with this long history of indigenous resistance to oppression. The working poor of Bolivia, united behind a common identity, against a common enemy, and toward common goals that they felt would improve their livelihood and finally provide them with true democratic self-governance. While the 1973 military coup abruptly halted President Allende's program for change in Chile, his initial success proved that socialism through democratic means was possible. Over three decades later, Bolivian President Morales continues to stand up to opposition forces determined to put an end to his policies. Overwhelming support for his re-election, however, demonstrated the extent to which the previously disenfranchised majority of the country is determined to keep in place the socialist changes they have experienced. In both Bolivia and Chile, agricultural workers and miners found common cause in their struggle against the injustices and oppression they endured under oligarchic rule and foreign-imposed economic programs. Widespread poverty in both nations provided the impetus for action, and social movements facilitated the democratic transition towards socialism. El pueblo. Unido jamás será vencido. El pueblo unido jamás será vencido. El pueblo unido jamás será vencido. El pueblo unido jamás será vencido. De pie cantar que vamos a triunfar. Avanzan ya banderas de unidad y tú vendrás marchando junto a mí. Yeah.